Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well today, Tim. The story that we are discussing today really leaves you with a lot of questions, I guess, more than answers. But one question that needs an answer right now is how are you? Oh, thank you very much for asking. I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here and talking about this case with our friend Jennifer Amell, who's joining us for this one. And this research was brought to us by Marianne White. So thank you very much, Marianne. This is a great uh, case to cover on this show. It's very mysterious. A lot of twists. I had not heard of it either. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, Marianne bringing this one to us. The story is the murder of Maria Ridolph, and this took place in Sycamore, Illinois, and she disappeared on December 3rd of 1957 at seven years old. She was abducted, and this spans the course of decades and decades, generations, and it's still in some way or another continuing to play out today, which is really one of the most mind-boggling aspects of this case. Yeah, it really is. Maria Elizabeth Ridolph disappeared on December 3rd, 1957, seven years old at the time, and she was found about five months after her disappearance, um, murdered. And uh, it, it, there are just a lot of twists in this case. There's at least a couple of suspects, one pretty good one who even went to prison, and we'll fully unpack this in the episode. I found it incredibly fascinating when we were speaking about this that we started off in a period where there was no DNA, where lie detector tests were still sort of in their infancy. Same thing with eyewitness accounts and et cetera, et cetera. And then you see how technology progresses and contributes to these results that play out as the investigation continues over the course of decades. So that's a really fascinating element. Also, check out the links to the sources that we have in the show notes. Really good articles in there, especially the one from the Daily Mail. And I know this case is from a while ago, Lance, but if anyone's got any information, they can call Illinois Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. And I think it's safe to say that once you are finished listening to this episode, you're going to feel a little bit frustrated like we felt, and you'll hear it in our tone. And that is going to make for a really heated episode of our subscription show, Tim, which people can access by doing what? Our listeners can access Missing Premium by subscribing right there in the Apple Podcasts app, or non-Apple users can go to missing.supportingcast.fm and subscribe there. It's $4.99 a month. You get these bonus episodes, Lance. I cannot wait to rant about this one. Plus, you get early releases, and it's all ad-free. And if anybody wants to sound off on us by contacting us via social media where in the world would they be able to do that they can find us on social media at missing csm thanks for listening everybody we're gonna break for commercial here and we'll be right back with our conversation with jennifer amell welcome back to the podcast jennifer amell how are you today I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. Man, I feel like it's been forever since all three of us have been discussing a missing persons case or a murder case in this It's episode. been a while. Yeah. yeah. It's been far too long, really. Well, I'm glad to, to be back and discussing this case today because it's, it's so complex and so interesting and it happened a while ago. So there's kind of like a checkered history um, how this case has progressed. It was unsolved and then it was solved and then it was unsolved again quite a ride quite a ride and it really is an epic piece of crime storytelling that marianne white put together for us uh, so big shout out to her and when i say epic i mean this happened like you said a long time ago this happened in 1957 and bring it all the way up to pretty much current and it's still happening it spans generations and it's so tragic you start off with the girl being seven years old. Then it just expands into this massive crime story. Sure does. Yeah. Big shout out to Mary Ann. Thank you very much for sending this. And she brought the case to us, too. It was a case I had not heard of. The case of Maria Elizabeth Riddolph. She disappeared on December 3rd, 1957 from Sycamore, Illinois. Maria is the youngest of four children that Michael and Francis Ridolph had. She has two sisters and a brother. 
And as you mentioned, Lance, she was seven years old at the time of her disappearance, 44 inches tall and 53 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes. So this happened in December of 1957, December 3rd. Maria was seven years old. She disappeared while playing outside of her home in Sycamore, Illinois, which is a small town about 60 miles west of Chicago. This is one of those creepy scenarios that always gets under my skin. So she's there playing with her eight-year-old friend, Kathy Sigmund. They were outside playing a game called Duck of the Headlights, which sounds like one of those games from the 50s that probably wouldn't be allowed today by most parents. Apparently, the girls would run back and forth trying to dodge headlights of oncoming cars. So... The days before the internet, kids got creative in the games that they played. And Kathy later reported that a young man approached the girls saying his name was Johnny and that he was 24 years old and not married. He was described as tall with a slender chin, light hair, a gap in his teeth, and a colorful sweater. And he asked the girls if they liked dolls and piggyback rides. Yeah, I mean, right off the bat, that's... That's a super creepy thing to say to two little girls. Like, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm this age and I'm not married. Like, Yeah, I don't understand why he (laughs) told so much about himself. I guess he was trying to get the girls to warm up to him. That or knew what he was about to do to one of them and wanted that information reported that is not accurate. It's not his age. It's not his name. You know? He apparently did get the girls to warm up to him because Johnny gave Maria a piggyback ride, according to Kathy, and Maria actually ran home to get one of her dolls to show him. And when she returned, Kathy decided to run home to get some mittens, leaving Maria alone with the unknown man. But when Kathy returned, Maria and the man were nowhere to be found. Yeah, that's a really interesting part, right? Why didn't this man abduct Kathy when he had the opportunity to? Yeah, makes you think he chose Maria for some reason. And maybe chose her prior to meeting these two girls in the street. It's interesting to me that he didn't have the opportunity to abduct Kathy when it felt like he was planting the seeds for one of them to run home and get a doll by saying, do you like dolls, piggyback rides? So when Maria takes that bait and runs back home, I would have thought that that would have been the opportunity to take one of the girls. But then he only takes Maria when Kathy decides on her own that she needs mittens. So I wonder what happened there. Well, he had an opportunity to take both of them, I guess. They they were both left alone with him at, at one point, but he seemed to choose Maria. But only by chance, right? Because there was no indication that... So. Ka- well, he didn't tell Kathy to run home and get her mittens. But Maria went home to get her doll, so he was alone with Kathy. Kathy. Yeah. Didn't do anything. And then by chance, Kathy says, I'm going to go get my mittens. He's got another opportunity that's just handed to him. So I'm saying like... I wonder if he even intended to do anything and realized that he could have done something with Kathy. And then when he had the opportunity to do it with Maria, he took advantage of it then. The police responded quickly and began to search the town along with several armed civilians. And within days, the FBI became involved with thoughts that perhaps the abduction took place across state lines. That's pretty standard, right? Like if it's a child abduction, the FBI will get involved kind of like off the bat, right? Yeah, it doesn't have to have anything to do with state lines um if it's a kidnapping uh case the fbi will get involved crimes that cross state lines the fbi can also get involved though right so several witnesses were interviewed who said they saw the girls playing outside that evening between 6 and 6 30 p.m but no one reported seeing this unknown man this guy johnny Using the information gained from these interviews, the FBI concluded that Maria was likely abducted sometime between 6.45 and 7 p.m. And her friend Kathy was placed into protective custody. She was the only one to have seen the man, this, this individual named Johnny. And the police actually did this because they feared that the man would come back to harm Kathy. I'm glad they took that precaution. My goodness. I don't want to mess around. Imagine being the parents of Kathy and your child's going into protective custody because of this thing that she witnessed that she narrowly escaped mm-hmm. without realizing it. I mean, that's that's kind of a messy abduction, though. Don't you think? Like, yeah, he approaches two girls, leaves one as a witness and uh, takes the other one. It, he didn't wait for a time when one of the girls was left alone to approach her like he... 
inter- introduced himself to both. So he was leaving himself open uh, to be identified by Kathy. And John Tessier was 18 years old at the time of the kidnapping and murder and a neighbor of the Ridolf family. And he became a suspect early on after police received a tip. He, however, claimed that he was on a train from northern Illinois to Chicago at the time of the kidnapping. And Tessier had been in Rockford, Illinois, December 2nd and 3rd, to take the necessary examinations and to enlist in the Air Force. And it was confirmed right by officers that he was, in fact, speaking with officers at the Rockford recruiting station at around 7.15 the evening Maria went missing. So it sounds like a pretty decent alibi unless someone signed off on the wrong date on a piece of paper or something. Sure, yeah, there's room for, like, you know, a margin of error there, time or day. But it seems like police bought this as an alibi. Tessier told the FBI that he called his stepfather additionally, like, after he was done uh, interviewing with these uh, recruitment officers, and that his stepfather came to Rockford to pick him up and gave him a ride back home. And Tessier was brought in for a lie detector test, which she apparently passed. And for these reasons, he was removed from the suspect list. And Kathy was never shown his photo or asked to identify him. Why wasn't she shown his photo? I don't understand. They brought her into protective custody. I felt like that would be one of the main reasons, obviously, her protection, but keep her memory unjaded right like you don't want everyone you don't want our parents and brother and sister asking her what the guy looked like and things like that you want to keep it so she can just tell the detectives yeah i guess they were so convinced that they didn't think it was necessary to like put kathy through that i suppose i know right does that speak to like however airtight his alibi was with the officers at the recruiting station basically confirming that he was there during the time Uh, I don't know. I feel like it's a combination of that and what you're saying, Jen, that, you know, maybe just putting someone in front of her is is enough to make her nervous to say that's the guy. And then he's gone. He leaves Sycamore for basic training in mid-December, which was the day after he was cleared as a suspect. You think that's something he might have brought up to his uh, fellow recruits in the Air Force, that he was just recently cleared as the prime suspect in a a, uh, kidnapping? Of a young girl? Yeah, I doubt it. So, like, veering into conspiracy lane here for just a second. So there is incentive for the military to, like, want him to leave as soon as possible. Like, judging by how quickly he did leave for basic training after he was cleared, maybe because police were holding him for questioning, this was holding up um, his being able to train. So would these recruitment officers or the... Uh, Air Force itself have any incentive to be like, yeah, 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 he's fine. Let him go and not really think about it. I don't know. I would hope not. I mean, yeah. they, they've got enough, like, you would think they have enough good enlistees that they don't have to take someone who's <laughs> suspected in a kidnapping, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, let's think about the time period too. Cause so this is like a decade after, or a little more than a decade after uh, World War II ended. Mm-hmm. Cold War era. Time of peace, I suppose. So I guess they wouldn't be too hard up for like enlistees or anything. No, you're right. The yeah. Korean War had ended a few years before this as well. Right. That was in the late 40s, early 50s? Early Something 50s. Like for like, I early think it 50s. ended in 53 or 54. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's not um, a period of time where... Uh, like new soldiers are being actively recruited. There's no um, draft in place, nothing like that. Yeah, I mean, and I guess if he's cleared by the police, then there shouldn't really be a risk to the Air Force in taking him. Yeah, unless there's kids in the Air Force. Well, yeah, I mean, then if he's, (laughs) you know, if he's guilty, at least it gets him out of the streets and gets him away from kids. I mean, we've definitely heard that before it's like what what happened to elvis like he was gonna be charged and like go to jail or he could have the choice to join the military yeah and in late december 1957 kathy was taken to dane county sheriff's office in madison wisconsin to see a lineup of possible suspects and she identified a man named thomas joseph rivard 
Rivard, however, had been in jail at the time of the abduction and had merely been used in the lineup to ensure that there were enough people in it, as police had actually suspected another man in the lineup was responsible for Maria's abduction. Oh, that's a blow to law enforcement, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, come She's on. just a, yeah, I mean, she's like seven years old. Um, it's hard to put a lot of stock in an ID of a kid that young but it's unfortunate that she fingered a man that they knew was not guilty you know and he also did not look anything like tessier appeared and was described in fbi documents as a 35 year old man approximately five foot four inches tall 156 pounds with dark blonde kind of bushy hair tessier on the other hand was much taller six inches taller 17 years younger and when Kathy was asked years later about the lineup, she said that she didn't even remember picking Rivard out of the lineup in the first place. And the case received national attention and the investigation continued, but police never developed any solid leads. And then in April of 1958, on April 26th of 1958, two tourists looking for mushrooms in a rural area in Woodbine, Illinois, found the skeletal remains of a young child under a partially fallen tree, wearing a shirt, undershirt, and socks. And the state of decomposition did not allow the remains to be immediately identified and suggested the body had been there for several months. I just want to make a quick note here that Marianne pointed out there are other sources that say these were not tourists, but a farmer or farmers. Yeah, and then so... Where Maria disappeared from in Sycamore, this place where her remains were found in Woodbine is about an hour and a half via car. So she traveled a bit of a distance, uh, but still in the state of Illinois. And unfortunately, through dental records and the clothes that she was wearing at the time of the abduction, they used those to identify positively those remains being Maria's. And since the crime occurred within the state of Illinois, the FBI withdrew from the case, leaving state and local police in charge. The autopsy did not determine a cause of death due to the level of decomposition. So back to Tessier, he ends up serving in the Air Force for 13 years and he rose to the rank of captain. So this is a good soldier. And then he later became a police officer in Lacey, Washington, which is east of Olympia, and he later joined a police department in Milton, Washington, but did not mesh well with the police chief there. And the chief actually documented multiple complaints about Tessier's work and conduct and attempted to fire him. And in 1982, Tessier took in two 15-year-old runaway girls, one of whom knew Tessier as a police officer in Milton. And Tessier was later charged with felony statutory rape after one of the girls reported engaging in sexual activity with him. Yikes. Yeah. So he pleads out of that. He pleads guilty to communication with a minor for immoral purposes, which is a misdemeanor. He's sentenced to one year probation and subsequently fired from the Milton Police Department on March 10th, 1982. So this upstanding soldier who rose to the rank of captain still has these base instincts that cause him to approach and engage in sexual activity with a minor yeah it's uh let's think about the like psychology of that kind of predation for a second so like 15 is much different from seven right like and i wonder if you are a pedophile and you are sexually attracted to children a lot of the times like it's either like prepubescent or like adolescent you know and they'll will like be attracted to that like age range uh generally and i wonder like if it's possible like psychologically speaking for um one of these you know predators to age in their own lives and then be attracted to maybe children but a little older kind of child i mean regardless we have um pedophilic behavior here in our one of the suspects in a in a child abduction and murder i'm curious if it had anything to do with him enlisting in the air force for 13 years when he was 18 years old because the difference between 18 and 15 you know you only have three years there and i wonder how much sexual activity he engaged in prior to the air force and what he could have been engaging in during the air force I wasn't thinking about it until you mentioned it, Jen. It does feel like someone who was stunted 
emotionally at a certain age to be attracted to um, somebody of the opposite sex at a similar age when they might have been stunted. You know, going into the military, getting broken down and built back up again. Maybe never. Maybe maybe one of his first loves was like 15. So he still has that kind of stewing in his subconscious. Yeah, I well, sure. But if we're assuming that this man is guilty of abducting and killing Maria, he would have been 18, around 18 at that time. Him being in love with a 15-year-old as an 18-year-old is not commiserate with abducting a small, small child. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. And then Tessier later changed his name to Jack Daniel McCullough in April of 1994, supposedly to honor his late mother. Weird. Yeah, I think that is a weird move, too, especially if you've got this career with your name uh, in the military that's like your first and last name, and now you're changing it. Why would you want to give up your rank? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it seems like a little bit of deception there. So then jump to 40 years later. In 1997, the case is deemed closed by Lieutenant Patrick Soler of the Sycamore Police Department. Lieutenant Soler named William Henry Redman as the person responsible for the kidnapping and murder of Maria. Redman was a former truck driver and carnival worker from Nebraska who died in 1992, five years before they deem the case closed. Yeah, and in 1988, Redmond had been charged with the 1951 kidnapping and murder of an eight-year-old girl in Pennsylvania. And the case ended up being dismissed because the police officer refused to provide the name of his confidential informant. Hmm. Before we go on with this, doesn't it feel like to you, kind of out of the gate, that someone in the police department... In, in the Sycamore Police Department was like, this dude could possibly be responsible. He's dead. But look at all of these other charges. Kind of matches the description. Maybe we can just close the books on this one. Like pin it on uh, Redmond? Yeah. Pin it on the deceased guy who definitely murdered someone. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. As a record. Transient carnival worker. That's just how it feels like when first learning about this. That's just how it feels. Right. And Redmond was also a suspect in the disappearance of a 10-year-old girl in Ohio. So at least two probable victims from this guy, Redmond. Yeah. And then Lieutenant Soler determined that Redmond's likely responsibility in the Ridolf case um, after an inmate said Redmond told him about a crime he committed that was very similar to what happened to Maria. He also closely matched the uh, physical description that Kathy had initially given of this uh, man supposedly named Johnny. However, Lieutenant Soler's report was highly criticized for its lack of solid evidence, and it was also believed that there were some political motivations behind closing this case. This stuff drives me crazy. Lieutenant Solar acknowledged that most of the evidence was circumstantial and it would have been difficult to convict Redman on the available evidence on its own. And it was for these reasons that Solar said that he called the case closed and not solved, which left for the possibility that a better suspect could be found in the future. That's not how you do it. No. That's lazy, lazy yeah. police work. Yeah. Yeah. And is it typical for inmates to confide in other inmates when describing um, the murder of a seven-year-old girl? Isn't that something that's like frowned upon amongst in- inmates? Wouldn't he be kind of putting a mark on his back by doing that? Unless it was a fedo- fellow pedophile. like Right. Yeah, I guess yeah. it depends on who you're telling. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what I've heard too, that... that- you know, there's like a code in prison and and the people who are in there, you know, don't like the child abusers or the people who, who hurt child uh, children in any way. So I think prisoners do talk to each other a lot. I mean, one thing we hear is that they're not always uh, accurate. Like sometimes they're looking for a day out yeah. of prison, like being taken around, mm-hmm. uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. If they have some information to bargain for whatever, I mean could be as little as like going to a, another room in the prison to talk to somebody. But then in 2008, the story continues. The case is reopened. Jack McCullough's half-sister, and of course McCullough is Tessier, 
His half-sister, Janet Tessier, came forward with new information. Janet claimed that on their mother's deathbed in 1994, she had stated that John was responsible for Rudolph's disappearance, and she wanted Janet to tell someone or do something about it. Wow. Jeez. And Janet had also heard from her sisters that their mother had lied to investigators about John being home the night Rudolph was kidnapped. Okay, so like the mother's statement wasn't part of his alibi though initially it was the army uh recruit or the uh the air force recruitment officers and his stepfather so how did how did that happen and also i'm not trying to make a joke here but why do people wait until their deathbed to make a confession like are you are, are you now entering the gates of heaven because you didn't say anything for 40 plus years now it's time to get it off your chest, and now you can pass with a clean conscience. What? Is that the reason? As uh, nonsensical as that does sound uh, to, to me and you, it, it, I think that is the reason, yeah. So in the meantime, you're perfectly capable and of knowing that a family is grieving their daughter's unsolved murder. You're, you're, perf- you're fine with, with that weighing on you. Yeah, I well, mean it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of hedging your bets, right, to get into yeah. heaven, um, to do the right thing. But I also can't imagine that that is an easy thing to do if you do believe your child is guilty of something as horrific as the murder of another child. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, what is your instinct as a parent and as a mother? It's probably to protect your own child. You'd think. Mm -hmm. So, I I mean, I get why that happens. Yeah, it's sad. But another half-sister, Mary Pat, was also there when their mother made the statement. And as it turns out, their older sisters had suspected that John was responsible for the crime many years earlier. Hmm. And by the time of their mother's death, McCullough, or Tessier, had been estranged from their family and was even told not to attend his own mother's funeral. And allegedly... He once threatened to shoot and kill Janet and had sexually molested another half-sister when she was a minor. Whoa. Oh, man. Yeah, this guy. I wonder when that happened. Like like right around the same time, you're thinking? Maybe. I think it would have had to have been, right? Because he went to the Air well, Force. Yeah, right, right, right. Because Johnny wasn't at home for the next, uh, whatever, 11 years. 13 years. Or I'm 13, sure he had like holidays and things yeah. like that. But Sure, yeah. But I'm, I'm imagining like... I don't know how much longer younger his half sister is, but I imagine, yeah, if it was uh, happening, it might have been happening around the time of Maria's uh, murder. Well, Janet certainly made some efforts. From 1994 to 2008, she had tried several times to get the police to look into her mother's statement. So. Good effort put forth on her side there. And Lieutenant Solar, who was with the Sycamore Police Department for part of this time, says that Janet never spoke to him about it. He also said that he would not have considered McCullough a suspect because he knew the Tessier family. What? What? Come on. And Ralph, their father, had painted the police cars, and John had been cleared by the FBI in 1957. Oh, his dad paints police cars. His son can't do it. That's that's a law. He painted the police cars. Yeah. yeah. It's like, what the guys, hell? if I repaint your police cars, can you turn a blind eye to my <laughs> sexually deviant son? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Painted the police cars. Well, this Lieutenant Solar sounds like a real crack detective. In 2008, however, Janet sent an email to an Illinois state police tip line. And this email sparked a new investigation by the state police cold case unit into the background and alibi of Jack McCullough. And the sisters told the investigators about their suspicions and they learned about his alleged molestation of his half-sister and possibly other girls. Another woman told investigators that he'd once given her a piggyback ride as a young girl and refused to put her down until her father had to intervene. So this guy is just lining everything right up again. Yeah, I mean, that piggyback ride thing is is certainly a a, a, a connection that, uh, that should not be overlooked. Yeah, agreed. And how creepy is it that he refuses to put down a girl until his until her father intervened? Oh my god. If that happened, uh Woo! I would absolutely <laughs> flip out. Lose it. 
Yeah. yeah. And you'd have every right to lose it because what yeah. adult male should be doing this? None, I'd None. say. <laughs> so throughout this new investigation, investigators developed a new timeline that made it possible that John Tessier could have been responsible for kidnapping Maria. So this new timeline provided enough wiggle room and enough time for uh, John to have gone to Rockford to meet with those recruiters and make that telephone call to his stepfather to come pick him up. And police wanted Maria's friend Kathy to review a photo lineup of possible suspects. They took four photos from the 1957 yearbook, but the fifth photo, the one of Jack McCullough, couldn't come from the yearbook since he had been expelled in high school. So the police took a more recent photo that they received from a former girlfriend. But John had an open collar in the photo where others didn't. And the background in his picture was dark, but light for all the other photos. And Kathy chose McCullough's photo from the lineup. Yeah, so you can see where that can become a problem because all of the other ones look like yearbook photos. And his looks like he's a lurking, open-chested stalker. Yeah, I could definitely uh, probably get that thrown out in court. But in 2010, the former girlfriend of Tessier contacted investigators saying she had found an unused train ticket from Rockford to Chicago dated December 1957. Wow. <laughs> that was <laughs> 50 years ago. Where did that what? come from? It was a, right? you found it in a coat? Yeah, right. I don't know. So this train ticket disproves the alibi that he was on the train at the time of Maria's disappearance. But investigators ultimately concluded that McCullough had not taken the train that day, but instead had driven his own car, making it possible that he could have been in Sycamore at the time of Maria's abduction and also had enough time to get up to Rockford. So that's confusing to me because he had called his stepfather for a ride, had he not? Yeah, that's a little confusing. And investigators also contacted a high school friend of McCullough's who remembered seeing his car that day and that he did not ever let anyone else drive his car. So he bought a train ticket, didn't take the train, drove instead, and still met with the recruiters. So that part is is all in line as far as the recruiters go, apparently. But yeah, that phone call is a bit confusing then. Yeah, I wonder if they have record of that phone call, like back at his uh, stepfather and mother's home. Um, I wonder if his stepfather lied about driving him back. Like, I don't know. Strange. This would have to be a lie. There's some lie there. Yeah, for sure. I think, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, on the for the, on the stepfather's part. I mean that that might track, right? If his wife at the time admitted to lying for John. You know, maybe that would make sense that the stepfather did too. I'm assuming they were the ones who were married. Yeah, I just can't quite like suss out why investigators believe he had taken his own car. I guess based on his friend's testimony that he saw the car. Well, the recruiters uh, d- did interview him ap- apparently that day. Mm-hmm. So he he did get to Rockford. Right. Uh, but why are they assuming that um, John drove to Rockford. I think this ticket would have been collected by the conductor, but they had it, you know? The girlfriend had it. So that's just an assumption that he drove. Could have. Yeah. Doesn't it feel like they're trying to create the timeline to make it work because they got this ticket that either shouldn't have been around because the conductor took it or maybe like they do like a hole punch in it or something to indicate. But if that was the case, why wouldn't he just do it on his own? Why would he keep the ticket in the first place? I don't know. This is a really... Right. This is a really convoluted part that I feel shouldn't be that convoluted. Yeah, it's crazy that that ticket survived. I mean, maybe he kept it because it he thought it proved his alibi, you know? Yeah, I think that's probably likely. And it's probably likely that he told his girlfriend, you know, what it meant um, to him, at least, you know, and he kind of, I guess, left it with her, right? That seems like the only reason she would present it so many years later if she had any idea that it was meaningful in the investigation. So a year after this whole train ticket thing and his girlfriend handing it over to police, in July of 2011, McCullough, who is now a retired police officer, was brought in for questioning. 
once more. And uh, apparently he was initially calm and cooperative, but when investigators began asking questions about Maria's disappearance and murder, he suddenly became evasive and aggressive. And when he refused to answer any further questions, he was arrested for the crime and extradited to Illinois. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. And at the same time, Maria's body was exhumed to check for any DNA evidence, but none was found. However, after finding nicks in her sternum and neck vertebrae, a forensic anthropologist concluded that Maria was stabbed at least three times in the throat with a long, sharp blade. Although this was the assumed cause of death, other causes like strangulation could not be ruled out because of the skeletal nature of the remains. The case did get some national attention after police learned that an arrest had been made in the 54-year-old murder. The DeKalb County State's attorney, Clay Campbell, was hesitant to take the case due to the lack of physical evidence and the amount of time that had passed between the case and the arrest. However, both the Ridolph and the Tessier families believed McCullough slash Tessier was guilty and pressed Campbell to move forward. Finally, Campbell formally charges Jack McCullough Tessier with the kidnapping and murder of Maria Ridolph in 2011, 54 years later. And the trial of Jack McCullough began in September of 2012 and was heard only by a judge. No jury was present. The judge did not allow any information related to Redmond being linked to the case. That was the other suspect saying that he had never been a credible suspect anyway. (laughs) Oh my gosh, you're a judge saying that? The prosecution argued that McCullough was a pedophile who planned to kidnap Maria but ended up killing her. They never mentioned anything about sexual assault at the trial because there was no physical evidence to prove it, even though it was widely suspected, and several people testified on behalf of the prosecution, including Kathy Sigmund Chapman, who identified McCullough as being Johnny on that day more than 50 years earlier. And several inmates also testified that McCullough had told them he killed Maria. So everyone seems to be talking while in prison. Right, but some of the details they shared apparently didn't match the evidence. For one, the prosecution brought in the new evidence that Maria had been stabbed, but one inmate said McCullough had strangled her with wire, and another said he accidentally smothered her to death when he was attempting to stop her from screaming. Neither said anything about stabbing. McCullough did not take the stand in his own defense, but his attorneys argued that there was no physical evidence, motive, or indication that McCullough was even in the area when the crime occurred. They suggested that the prosecution only took the case because of pressure from the Ridolf and Tessier families. That's kind of hard to believe. That this case has been floating out there for like 55 years, 54, 55 years, and just now, the prosecution is succumbing to pressure from the families. Uh, yeah, I know. I'd believe it if it were like a couple months after the murder yeah. or something. But yeah, that's a really good point, Lance. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on September 14th of 2012, Jack McCullough was found guilty of kid- of the kidnapping and murder of Maria Rudolph. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Uh, He was 73 years old at the time of his sentencing. Could you imagine going through 50 plus years of your life if you're not guilty of this crime? Having this like be in your life every single waking moment only to have it right at the very end of your life. You're 73. That's when you get sentenced to this crime. This is his entire life. I mean, it's better than the alternative if he is innocent. Yeah. um, Spending his life in prison, (laughs) I guess. But yeah, I mean, hard to suss out how I personally feel about this. I don't know. Well, he was sentenced. Case closed, right? (laughs) Uh, Not exactly. There were some appeals. McCullough appealed the case, and the Illinois Appellate Court upheld his murder conviction on February 13th, 2015. They did, however, vacate his convictions for kidnapping and abduction of an infant because the statutory limitations for those crimes in 1957 was only three years. This had no effect on his life sentence. And in the appeal, the court also ruled that Tessier's mother's deathbed statement should not have been admitted to court, and this did not affect the upholding of the murder convictions since it was said to not play a major role in the decision to convict. (laughs) 
my question is what what was the decision to convict it doesn't really sound like they have anything on him yeah other than like maybe a, a little bit of time in his alibi just circumstantial stuff yeah some circumstantial stuff honestly the piggybacking of a different girl is probably like the biggest smoking gun to me and maybe because this was a bench trial and not a jury trial that's the only reason he got convicted at all probably possibly i mean <sighs> and a yeah. storied history of pedophilia too <laughs> like yeah, I mean, certainly not a good guy. No. So Tessier goes from not testifying in defense of himself to representing himself in 2015 by filing a petition for post-conviction relief asking his murder conviction be set aside. And the petition was quickly dismissed, but McCullough's public defender from his trial had stayed in touch and continued to investigate the case, even though he was no longer representing McCullough. He requested that the court reconsider the dismissal, and McCullough filed a successive motion that could not be dismissed without a hearing with the state attorney's office. And fast forward to April of 2016, the current DeKalb County State's attorney, Richard Schmack, filed a petition to throw out McCullough's conviction, and McCullough's attorneys requested a new trial. And this came after Schmack conducted a six-month-long post-conviction review of the evidence, and a statement was made in March that said thousands of pages of police reports were improperly excluded, which pointed to McCullough's innocence. Wow. So many twists and turns here. I know, right? But where is that evidence then? First of all, why wasn't it apparently put in the case file? But wh what is that evidence? You know, the question begs to be asked. Right. That points to his innocence. I right. wonder. Is it just as circumstantial as the evidence that pointed to his conviction, I wonder? Like, what do we have here? Do we have signed off? affidavits from the recruitment office or something like well we have a couple things here so according to the additional evidence that had been left out or excluded from the uh, trial there was a phone call that was made from mccullough to his mother while he was in rockford that day at trial it was alleged the call was made from sycamore when in reality phone records showed that mccullough made a collect call while in rockford so he did call his mother slash stepfather, potentially for that ride. And then records further showed that McCullough was in or near a post office in northern Illinois when Maria disappeared. He made that call from a payphone and contacted a U.S. Air Force recruiting station. The shortest distance from Sycamore to the Rockford post office is 35 miles. So according to Schmack... It was not possible for McCullough to have made the call from Rockford at the time he did and be in Sycamore at the time Maria disappeared. He also stated that the lineup in which McCullough had been identified as the suspect was highly suggestive in nature, which I think we had commented on before, too. Yeah. Wow. Definitely. Mm -hmm. That. Yeah, is well, I was right. Criminal, like, that that judge excluded that evidence. And Jack McCullough's conviction was vacated, and he was ordered a new trial. And so he was released from prison on April 15th, 2016, and the charges against him were formally dismissed on April 22nd, 2016. And because the murder charge was dismissed without prejudice, it was understood that he could be made to stand trial again for the murder of Maria Ridolph in the future if a prosecutor chose to do so. That's interesting. I, I'm not really familiar with uh, dismissed without prejudice, like what that term means. But like, don't we have a federal law, like a right to like, isn't that double jeopardy? Yeah. Yeah. It, I think it, if he was found not guilty in that first trial, yeah, then it would have been that that would be double jeopardy. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. But apparently being dismissed without prejudice makes it so that's first not in convicted. play, I guess then dismissed without prejudice. So that leaves it open to then like charge him again. Right. But then about a full year later on April 12th, 2017, he was exonerated and declared innocent by the DeKalb County Circuit Court. Holy moly. And on top of this, he files a federal lawsuit seeking damages for his wrongful conviction. The city of Sycamore settled their case in 2017 for $350,000 in 2020, the city of Seattle settled for $300,000, and in July of 2020, the state of Illinois settled for 
$3,975,000. He was also awarded $95,000 in compensation from the state of Illinois. So he's a millionaire. Oh, he made out like a bandit. Wow. And the Maria Ridolf Memorial Map, an eight-foot map of Sycamore made of steel and porcelain, was mounted on the outside of the front of the Sycamore Municipal Building in 1958 in memory of Maria Ridolf. And it was replaced in 2002 with a bronze memorial plaque, which sits on top of a pedestal outside of the municipal building. And the Ridolf family also established a memorial fund, which was used to pay for the memorial map and later used to help fund children in need. I wonder how much of that $3,975,000 McCullough donated to this fund. And the kidnapping and murder of Maria Ridolf once again remains unsolved. Wow, that was a journey. An epic tale. Yeah. That's always so hard to discuss child murderers. And they've never they've never considered anybody else seriously, other than the handful of people and this guy who went to jail and now is a millionaire. Yep, and that guy Redmond who was an yep. actual like child murderer. Well stay tuned for hidden opinions because I'm sure we'll have a lot to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely won't hold back. Wow, yeah, this is a uh, an absolutely wild case. Thank you to Mary Ann White for bringing it to us. And we'll give out the Illinois State Police phone number. If you've got any information, please call 1-866-532-3700.